There are many strange sights found throughout the New World. An island that rains lightning, a sea of boiling water, and I also hear that there's a huge golden casino floating around somewhere. But there is one legend that some folks tell, how on foggy nights ships can hear a blood-curdling call in the distance, like from some ancient gargantuan animal. Even the saltiest of sailors have their hair stand on end just from hearing its sad cry. Some have even claimed to see it through the fog, slowly moving through the seas, draped in mystery. This is known only as the Phantom Island of Zoe. All right. Let's get one thing straight right off the bat. I cannot stress this enough, so I want you to all pay attention. I am not a furry, okay? I will reiterate this fact one more time, and just to make sure that you understand it completely, I'm gonna put this panda hat back on. I am not a furry. Okay. <laughs> In all honesty, if you want to understand, if you want to know the joke, I'll tell it to you. The joke is that I tell you I'm not a furry when I'm obviously doing a video about Minx and you know how much I love Kara, which, oh my god, she is like the most kawaii like character ever. Um, and I have this panda head here, which, by the way, they just sold these at Walmart. Like, that's not something I had to special order or anything. Um, but I tell you that I'm not a furry because there's some people out there in the audience that are like, oh, yeah, but, oh, is he? So there's some people that legitimately think I am, even right now, watching this right now, as I tell you, I am not, you're still like, oh, no, you, you totally are. It's cool if you are, but it's totally are. But there's other people that are like, is he? That's the joke. So the fact that there's, like, such a dichotomy here, that's the point I'm trying to get across here. It's it's this kind of, like, yin-yang thing that's that's balanced, but... Oh, okay, whatever. Let's, um, let's get to it. So, I already did a video about all the different species in the One Piece world. Uh, just kind of like an overview thing. You know, humans, giants, fishman, mermaids, minks included, long leg, long arm, snake neck. Um, just kind of a general video. So, if you just want, like, a brief overview of all of the different species, go check that out. Um, but, you know, I thought I could go into detail with each individual species. Uh, I know I wanted to do another giant video because, you know, that's just such an interesting topic topic and you know Elbaf and all that stuff so I want to do something about that and I figured eh screw it let's talk about all the different species in separate videos and you know I just decided to start off with the mink tribe for reasons that I honestly couldn't tell you why okay okay Wanda's boobs probably played a role into this boobs play a role into a lot of things uh, that's one thing you always have to know about Oda uh, it doesn't matter the species or the race or whatever he introduces uh, every arc consistently every arc in the story a character with large boobs has to be introduced. It's just, it's just a law with him. So, uh, okay. Um, I, I looked into this, and even though the Ming tribe is a fairly new species that was introduced in the One Piece story, um, in just the last hundred chapters or so, uh, this is when we first saw Zoe and the giant elephant or island or elephant, uh, Zunisha, and uh, the city of Zoe is the actual name of the country on the back of said elephant, and then you have the Ming tribe, which were a bunch of anthropomorphic uh, animals that are living on its back there uh, inside the country ruled by Duke Dogstorm Inurashi and uh, Master Cat Viper Nekamamushi. Um, there's actually a lot of uh, culture and stuff built up that Oda did and uh, a lot of stuff in, like just in terms of how they fight and you know the whole backstory with Zunisha which it is, uh, in and of itself is a very mysterious thing. Um, like I'm just gonna start off with that because it's something that's really been bugging me okay. Um I don't think the minks always lived on Zo. I mean, it's kind of hard to say that because Zo, in and of itself, is is an elephant. Okay, so there was a point when Zunisha was, you know, not born yet. So obviously, the minks did not live on it back then. Um, the minks have probably been around for a lot longer than Zunisha's been around. At least we can assume so. So, from what I can gather here, something happened around a thousand years ago that caused the Minx to hop on the back of Zunisha, and then Zunisha was forced to wander the seas of the New World seemingly aimlessly, but it might have a clear destination, 
and now here we are like a thousand years later and just nobody remembers the history nobody remembers what it was like all the minks that grow up on zo only know what it's like to uh, what it's like to live on the back of zunisha um, and it's also been stated, sort of like a prophecy amongst the minks, there will come a day when they'll have to leave the safety of Zunisha's back. It kind of reminds me of, you guys ever watch Legend of Korra? The second season of Avatar The Legend of Korra, when we find out about the first Avatar, Wan, and how humans lived on the back of lion turtles back in the olden days before they, you know, left and they learned about the bending and all that crap. Um, kind of reminds me of that sort of nature, and it's all based off a lot of mythology. Like the concept of a race of uh, people or animals, however you want to, you know, to describe the minks, uh, living on the back of an elephant. That's kind of indicative of an old Hindu myth where the world is supported. There's a giant turtle, all right, and on, on the back of that giant turtle, there's a giant elephant. And then on top of the giant elephant, that is what the world is, like that, that's supported on that. So there's a lot of different mythologies involving this. I'm just looking into like the history of the minks. I have another idea on where the minks came from exactly and how they ended up on the back of Zunisha. But for right now, let's just talk about the species in general rather than the mobile island elephant that, you know, carries them from place to pay, uh, place. Right, so just like how the fishmen and the merfolk are all based off of marine animals, uh, the minks are based off of just mammals. So, and they're more similar to the fishmen rather than the merfolk. The fishmen and the minks, they're still anthropomorphic. They have two legs and two arms. It's just the fishmen, like their skin might be colored differently and they have like gills and their eyes might be bulbous depending on the kind of fish they're based off of. The minks still still have two legs and two arms. They're just covered in fur, and their designs are based off of a particular mammal. We have cat minks, we have dog minks, we have monkey minks, uh, primate minks in general, we have uh, rabbit minks like carrot, we have horse minks, uh, things of that nature. And the defining trait here for how the minks, uh, you know, consider what is okay to, like, eat, because as you can imagine, like, if you're a horse mink, you might have some problems eating horse because it's like, okay, that's it's a member of my family kind of here, you know what I mean? Um, the defining factor is the amount of uh, fur or hair that you have on your body. So things that don't have hair, like amphibians, reptiles, you know, things like snakes and the crocodiles that are kind of like the horses on Zoe, like they use these crocs to, like, carry them from, you know, transport them from one place to another, uh, fish, you know, things of that nature they don't consider minks, so it's okay to eat. However, even humans who don't have that much hair just on our heads, the minks still consider them one of them, just kind of like lesser minks, and they're very welcoming to outsiders in that regard, uh, even though there's like stories or myths uh, passed around the One Piece world, like they, they paint the mink tribe as like uh, like cannibals or something, like yeah, they hate humans, if you get close to the mink tribe, they'll like hunt you down and kill you or something. No, the minks are very welcoming, um, even a little bit more so than humans might be, because they like have this uh, this uh, welcoming thing, that how, how they say hello or thank Thank you called Garachu, where they kind of like, you know, get up and rub their face against you and like lick you. And, you know, you see scenes like this between Nami and Wanda and it's getting a little kinky. I I'm not going to lie. It's you sitting there like, huh? Somehow I feel like if Wanda was a normal human, I don't think they would have been okay with having an, a, a, an episode where, you know, like a normal human is just licking Nami's face. For some reason, I feel like that wouldn't be cool, but uh, if it's a mink, it's it's fine. Um, also, something you might notice that Oda is doing, like it's a kind of like a thing that he's kind of spreading throughout his story, is that whenever you have a different race that's introduced, you know, either the fishman or the minks or whoever, he always, you know, sends this, this idea of like, we're we're not really that different. Um, the way that we treat each other, despite the fact that we all look radically different, because look at fishmen, there's a variety of different kinds of fishmen. Their skin's a variety of different colors, ranging from like blue to pink to red to green. Uh, the minks are all different animals. Oda always has this sense of solidarity between these tribes and these races. They're like, there is really no racism that much between the minks or anything like that. It's not like, you know, you're the, you're the horse minks and we're the cat minks, so obviously we're superior. There's nothing like that. There's like this sense that like we're all the same and Oda kind of drives this in even deeper whenever he talks about how these races uh, procreate and the way that the fishmen and the merfolk do it is kind of the same way as the minks I'm not going into no I'm not going there 
I'm just simply stating that the genes work a little different. Um, and in that, like, let's say you get um two cat minks together and they have a baby. It's gonna be a cat mink, right? Or let's say you get a cat and a dog mink together. That obviously means that the offspring has to either be a cat or a dog. No, 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 no. You see, the genes work, you know, way, way back. So if in the cat mink's ancestry way back there was a monkey mink somewhere, then a cat and a dog mink could get together and have a monkey mink, and that's just normal. And no one judges, no one's sitting there, like, you know, treating them with prejudice or anything like that. It's the same thing with fishmen. You could have a goldfish fishman and a shark mermaid get together, and they could have an octopus merman, and that's just normal. So that's what Oda does. He's kind of kind of treating us like, hey, guys, come on. These I'm creating these races, and they, they all get along, and it's like they're beyond racism to a certain point. Well, in a certain few instances, like we, we, every now and then you get an Arlong, every now and then you get a Horty, but um, yeah, all, all told together, those races don't really fight amongst themselves for those reasons. So that, that's pretty neat. I, I like the message that Oda is spreading here, right? Now, despite the fact that they said they are very welcoming to outsiders, they even have a thing called the Bell of Welcoming, or the Welcome Bell, that they ring whenever they get visitors. They probably get really excited, because they don't get that many visitors to a... If your island is a giant elephant that's constantly moving, you probably don't get people stopping by just to say hello every now and then. So whenever it does happen, they get excited, like, <gasps> Visitors! Finally! Other people! Great! Um, oh, and by the way, something really quick about Zunisha, the elephant. Um, it's actually a very special kind of elephant that has extremely long legs, which makes sense, because the first time I saw Zunisha, like, walking around the ocean, I'm thinking, oh, that's cool, it's obviously a really big elephant, but even with the scale of how big Zunisha's body is, um, the legs would have to be ridiculously long in order to reach the bottom of the ocean, and Oda actually drew a sketch of what Zunisha looks like in full view, and yeah, sure enough, the legs are super, super long. Um, but yeah, so, they're very welcoming, but they're also extremely loyal, and I would liken this to the fact that they're, you know, very animalistic in nature, the way they're designed, and animals can be extremely loyal. Um, so whenever Rizo was, you know, uh, given, uh, uh, like, asylum there, like, safe haven in Zo, uh, whenever Jack showed up and obviously, like, wrecked the place trying to find Rizo, they did not, um, it's starting to thunderstorm outside, so you might hear something in the background. Um, but whenever, Ra whenever Jack showed up to wreck the place, like, where is Rizo the ninja? Obviously, they were super loyal, and they didn't tell him a thing, even if it meant, like, their entire civilization getting wiped out. They would not tell him. However... When the Straw Hats showed up and saved the country from the gas attack and everything and, and nursed them back to help and they were their allies and everything and they were very friendly toward the Minks, uh, the Minks still did not tell the Straw Hats. That's how loyal they are. Even if it's like, okay, these people are trying to wreck our island, they're trying to get it out of us through sheer force. Where is Rizo? Well, we're not going to tell them. Oh, here come the Straw Hats. They're very nice. They saved us from the gas weapon. They nursed us back to health. Well... We're still not going to tell them even out of thanks, because that's not who the message is for. And of course, finally, when Kanemon and Kondro show up and they announce that they're members of the Kozuki clan and they're retainers of, of, the, of the Daimo, that's when the, the Minks finally have, like, oh, okay, we can tell you that our mission is complete. That's how loyal they are, right? So... In terms of battle prowess, they are extremely adept. Um, really cool. Even figuring that you would live on this uh, islefant out in the middle of nowhere, you don't have to really worry about people attacking your, your city all that much. But even so, all of the minks are capable of fighting since birth, and they're capable of you know being very adept in combat all the way up into their old age. So the minks have a weapon called Electro. It's something that's naturally just given to all of them. All minks are capable of using this uh, from really, I guess, a really really young age. Uh, Carrot even stated that the uh, whenever she ran into Randolph in Totland, the fact that Randolph did not use Electro is a tall tale sign that he's just not a mink, because I guess it's just so much seeped in mink culture that just everybody knows how to use it, just like they would use like their own two hands. It's just a common thing that they all have. So, yeah. Um, Electro is just the ability to channel electricity through your limbs. Uh, you can either use this directly, you know, like electric punch, electric kick. You ever get electric kicked by a horse? 
It hurts. Uh, you could also channel it through weapons. You know, some Mings, like Sicilian and Pedro, they have swords. They channel their electric sword attack. Um, things like uh, Carrot's gauntlets. She has those uh, those bunny gauntlets that she can channel them through. You know, the little spikes pop out and, like, the little claws. So uh, there's a wide variety of different techniques around Electro. This is something that's very indicative of their culture. They've had this for centuries, so they've obviously, had, uh, like, invented weapons with a specific uh, function of channeling Electro through it. Now, I like to think the reason that they can all use Electro is because it, they have fur on their bodies and it's static electricity. So it's like they they learn how to just channel like they can just because they, they've, you know, been like this for, you know, this is their species. They just learn how to naturally subjugate this static electricity and channel it wherever they want. Just a theory, but it's an idea. You know what I mean? And just to really just drive home how strong just like a base level mink is, um, and this was seen a lot more in the anime, granted, than in the manga, but whenever uh, the beast pirates attack Zo, uh, you had Jack and the gifters and the pleasures, and they were raiding the island, you know, attacking, you know, the women and children. Uh, the little children were able to fight back fairly well. The elderly, like that old monkey dude, he was able to fight back fairly well. So yeah, that that might just be Oda because he's in we're in the new world now and we need to have like strong characters. Like obviously if this was just an island that was isolated and the people didn't know how to fight very well, uh it's like okay, how can you really survive in the new world unless you have a way to fight? Because yeah, Zo probably doesn't get attacked very often, but they still have to be strong enough to survive the new world, just like the climate alone. So it makes sense like just why base level they're that strong. Uh they have another technique which is a little bit more or dangerous depending on who you are because considering an electro is something that even children learn how to use at a very very young age uh, and all minks have kind of like a mastery over it uh, the other thing is the Sulong transformation and how this work it's called moon lion and during a full moon basically like the werewolf legend during a full moon whenever a mink looks at the at the full moon in the sky for a long enough period of time unobstructed uh, so it won't work if like there's clouds in the sky or if they have glasses or anything that just like obstructs their view but if they just kind of like stare directly at the moon for like a few seconds uh, they begin their Sulong transformation and it transforms them into a new form uh, and it depends on how much training they had with it. I, from what I understand every mink is capable of doing this it's just that after you uh, achieve the transformation you have to go through specific training in order to actually control it. So Carrot did have such training and she was able to handle it for a few minutes. Uh, there is an upper limit to this though because eventually Carrot got you know exhausted and she couldn't really move around and she had to just all, all it takes to disengage the form is just obstruct your vision but if you don't have proper training and you go into Sulong you're basically just a berserker kind of like how Peckoms was so if you're a berserker going around attacking things you don't really have the clarity of mind to be like oh let me cover my eyes to transform back into my regular form where I'm not a berserker no you're berserking so you're like gotta destroy um so yeah we don't know exactly know what the training involves there and every minks uh, uh, Sulong transformation probably looks a little bit differently, but carries with it similar powers. Um, it's a huge boost of Electro whenever you go into it. Uh, whenever uh, Carrot went to her Sulong, it looked like a, like a Super Saiyan 2 kind of transformation thing, like the bioelectricity just like shooting off of her hair. Uh, we even saw that a little bit when Peckoms went into his Sulong, like the static shooting off of his hair as well. By the way, what happened to Peckums? Last time we saw him, he was being pinned down and threatened to get his eyes gouged out by the Big Mom Pirates. We don't really know what happened to him. I hope he's okay. I hope he didn't get his eyes clawed out because... He doesn't deserve that, but um, yeah, so the Sulong form, I, I hope we'll definitely get to see more of it in the future. It also kind of boosts all their other base stats, like Carrot was able to kind of like, she's a bunny mink, so she's able to jump rather well, so in her Sulong form, she's basically yeah, like Geppo, essentially. Like, she was able to jump off the mast of the Thousand Sunny and just kind of swoop across the water and then land on Daifuku's fleet ships, which were like, you know, a fair distance away. Um, so all their natural stats are boosted, as well as with healing as well. I I remember when the Sulong was revealed, people were thinking that, like, oh, Pedro's gonna look at the moon and heal himself. I'm like, okay, um, I never figured that, because it's like, there, there's a difference between having, like, a healing factor, you know, like, if, if Carrot was in her Sulong form and she got, like, sliced down the front with a sword, I could buy, you know, her being in her Sulong form in the wound, like, you know, closing up rather fast. Um, Pedro blew himself up 
with dynamite. At least I think it was dynamite. It caused a pretty big explosion. So it might have been like freaking antimatter or something. Pedro is like in pieces. There's part of him over there. There's part of him over there. Unless this is something like the fucking T-1000 from Terminator 2. You know, like the moon shines over Pedro's remains and he's like, I am reborn! <laughs> you know, something like that. I don't like Majin Buu. It's not going down, all right? Pedro is dead, all right? He is dead as disco. And I don't know if you guys heard about this in 2018. Disco's pretty damn dead, so... Yeah, but, uh, yeah, it does give you a boost of, you know, attack, you know, defense, reflexes, stamina, basic mink abilities. Um, I guess I should also talk about that. Depending on the kind of mink you are, you're going to have different tendencies based off the animal you're, you're based on. So, for example, carrot is a rabbit. Rabbits jump. So, Carrot just kind of has, like, a natural Geppo ability, where she was going after Zoro, and then she, like, jumped, and then she jumped again in midair to dodge Zoro's swing, and then attacked him from behind. She just kind of naturally has that jumping ability being a rabbit mink. Um, you know, uh, all minks kind of have, like, an increase of, like, uh, smell and hearing, uh, because, like, just animals are better at that kind of stuff. Um, dog minks, like Wanda, she stated that they have a, a love for bones because, you know, they're canines. Uh, Nekomo Mushi, a cat mink, is into things like cats are into. Like, he eats lasagna. Like, Oda actually wrote that in, that Nekomanushi, his favorite food is lasagna because of Garfield. <laughs> God damn it, Oda. Really? Okay, fine. And uh, he likes... To, by the way, don't feed your cat lasagna. I don't have a cat. I'm cat sitting right now for a friend, actually. But um, I've never fed a cat lasagna. I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to do that. But um, yeah, cat, being a cat mink, Nekomamushi also likes to play with like the little like cat toys and stuff like that. So yeah, they all have a, a basis for that. Uh, primate minks, you know, have good agility through trees and things and are really in love with bananas, you know? Okay, so that's that's how that goes, what you would expect. Also, from the way that I'm setting this up, you know, with the island, you know, traveling, you might think they're, like, sequestered on there. Like, they're supposed to, like, there's some kind of, like, uh, rule that minks have to stay on Zoe at all times. No, not really. There's been plenty of minks that have, you know, left Zoe and traveled the world. If they really want to, they can. Um, so it's not like they're, like, kept there or something like that. It's not like Nekomamushi and, and Inurashi are like, no one's allowed to leave. This is our home country. No. Uh, Beppo left, uh, in, in search of his older brother, Zeppo, uh, who left left before him as part of the Nox Pirates, so they were a pirate crew from Zoe. They were allowed to leave. Um, and also, by the way, while doing research for this video, Beppo, he was the first mink revealed in the story before we even knew what minks was as part of Law's Heart Pirates, but um, did you know that we actually have Beppo's bounty? It was something that was revealed in a data book, and uh, it's, it's similar to how Chopper's bounty is so ridiculously low. Chopper's bounty is only 100 berries. If you don't know, Beppo's bounty is the second lowest in the story at 500 berries like my okay i can okay chopper i kind of understand because when chopper is in his brain point he looks like a harmless pet you know he looks like oh he's so cute and all of his all of his bounty posters have him in his brain point form so the world government might just think that he's a cute little mascot not really worth giving a real bounty to but look at beppo beppo is a free he's a freaking polar bear he's an anthropomorphic polar bear that knows karate and shit like he's taken out multiple marines before well chopper has as well but you know what i mean like beppo could f you up hard so it's like come on marines you're just being freaking dicks you're being kind of prejudiced at this point i would assume you're like oh well yeah he's a karate chopping polar bear but he's a freaking mink give him a low bounty like it, okay come on that's just being mean you know what i mean and he's the navigator of the heart pirates he has a rank on the crew damn i feel bad for minks i feel bad for beppo where's the beppo love damn it I guess I should also kind of talk about the uh, night and day thing they have on Zoe. Well, this was this was something that didn't always exist. This was something that's a little bit more recent. So Inarashi Duke Dogstorm is known as the ruler of the day, and Nekomamushi Cat Viper is known as the ruler of the night. And they have alternating shifts. So from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. that's Inarashi's time as the ruler of Zoe, and from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. that's when Nekomamushi takes over. And this happened. Uh, 
uh, a few decades back, I guess the two, they used to be really good terms. They used to like sail together aboard the Whitebeard Pirates and the Roger Pirates, but they got into a disagreement with each other at some point and they decided to split their rule. And so because of that, their individual followers kind of have a an adjusted schedule for that. Whereas whenever 6 o'clock p.m. rolls around, if you're a member of Inurashi's squad, you do start, I mean, uh, the Three Musketeers, you do start to get like physically exhausted, like at that moment, like you kind of just like fall asleep where you're standing and uh, Inarashi has to go to sleep as well and that's when Nekamamushi and his like the forest guardians awaken and they take over but it didn't always used to be like this and I'm sure the former rulers of Zo might probably didn't have this this setup this is something rather new in only the last few decades uh, Zunisha has been traveling the world since before the void century the void century occurred 900 to 800 years ago or I guess I should say 800 to 900 years ago that was the void century and Zunisha's been walking around, or at least Zunisha is stated to be around a thousand years old, so it probably wasn't on this trek when it was just born. It was probably born, and then the Void Century happened, and then something occurred during the Void Century, which forced Zunisha to begin wandering the seas as punishment for something that it did. Um, and I'm also going to bring up, because of the way that this is set up, like, Zunisha doesn't walk very fast. It just kind of, like, lumbers around the ocean. But you'd figure if it's been walking this way for... Walk this way! Walk this I'm sorry, Aerosmith. Um, but you figure, like, if it's walking at even a steady pace for 800 years or more, it would eventually, you know, circumnavigate the world at some point. So I imagine the path that Zunish is taking, it, it might be like a consistent path. You know, it. one of my ideas is that it's like an infinity loop, like it's literally, because it's stuck in the new world. It doesn't leave the new world. All right, so it's only in this little strip of the Grand Line of the New World, walking back and forth between this specific path, maybe. Or maybe it's just wandering all over the place. And it's eventually, like, it's supposed to arrive at a destination, but it has to be a specific time for that destination. And Zunisha will just know until it, it gets to that point. Um, Zunisha is also conscious, and, you know, it's aware of itself. It can speak. However, none of the members of the Ming tribe on Zo have ever ever actually heard it before. Um, uh, Momonosuke was like the first person aside from the Daimo uh, to actually understand the, the you know, uh, what Zunisha is saying. There are other people like Roger and Luffy that can hear the voices of all things, but they cannot communicate back to Zunisha. So Luffy could hear when Zunisha spoke, but could not, Zunisha could not hear Luffy. That was something specific to Momonosuke, which has led a lot of people to think that maybe uh, it's sort of like a Shirahoshi Sea King thing, whereas Shirahoshi is the ancient weapon Poseidon and can control Sea Kings. So Momonosuke, it might be the ancient weapon Uranos and can control uh, Zunisha. I, I don't think it's the same thing. For one, I feel like that's just kind of like a rehash thing on Oda's part. Also, think of it this way. Shirahoshi can control the Sea Kings, which are found all over the world of One Piece and are these giant leviathan-sized sea monsters. That's a serious threat if those things can be organized. They can destroy pretty much any island that you set your sights on. Uh, Zunisha is just a single thousand-year-old elephant and is strong in its own right. I mean, pfft fuck jack shit up pretty damn hard. Um, but uh, in terms of like a like an ancient weapon... Like, I don't think Zunisha could really be all that useful, you know? Like, yeah, Zunisha could probably destroy an island, sure, but Jack was kind of in danger of bringing that thing down. Like, so, I, I don't think Zunisha's an ancient weapon or anything like that. I think the thing with the Daimo and, uh, and, and Momonosuke, it's something, it's something else is going on here, not related to the ancient weapon. Because, let's imagine it is. Like, okay, Zunisha, I command you to destroy that island! Okay. We'll get there in about five years. And then finally when you get to the island, like, oh shit, a giant elephant's attacking us! Uh, Jack had a, you know, a small fleet of battleships and cannons, and they were bombarding Zunisha's legs, and it was beginning to get injured. And Zunisha was, like, even crying out in pain and telling Momonosuke, like, hey, uh... I need a command. I cannot act unless I'm given a command because of the sin I committed. Uh, but if you don't hurry up, I might not be able to keep you guys safe much longer. Kind of stating that, like, Jack's, Jack 
you know, his, his attacks were actually working against Zunisha. So if Zunisha was an ancient weapon attacking an island, the islanders could just take out conventional weaponry like cannons and shit and blast it, and it could probably get taken down. Uh, Zunisha's a thousand years old. It's rather decrepit. It could still get around, but it's frail, is what I'm saying. So yeah, I don't think Zunisha's an ancient weapon or anything like that. Um, as for the nature of the promise or the sin that it committed... I'm going to throw something out there, and this is, I admit, something I just kind of came up with as an idea. But, um, okay. Let's say during the Void Century, like, okay, so Zunisha was already, like, a hundred years old, maybe even older during the time of the Void Century. So Zunisha might have already been very large uh, by that time. And uh, I hope to see a flashback of little, young, like, chibi Zunisha. That would be adorable. But anyway... Let's say that uh, something happened and the mink tribe were normal humans that got cursed to become minks. And then they uh, were forced onto the back of Zunisha for protection or something. Or if you don't want to go with the whole humans turned into minks, let's say the mink tribe existed the same way they did back then, except they were being attacked or being threatened to be executed. Maybe the mink tribe was a lot more diverse back in the day and they just got like wiped out, like genocided or something. And they had to escape to, you know, Zunisha in order to, like, as a safe haven in order to escape. Because there are a lot of minks that live on the back of Zunisha, but um, in terms of, like, you know, that, that's, like, that's their whole culture right there on Zo. Some of them have left, but in terms of, like, the population center of minks, yeah, that's all they got. So, um, yeah, that's uh, maybe an idea there. I was thinking maybe they were cursed humans or something, because this happened during the Void Century. No one would be able to remember it. Uh, the minks that currently live on Zo don't wouldn't, wouldn't have any memory of this because it happened so damn long ago so yeah I'm just throwing out ideas there on what happened as for the nature of the the sin that Zunisha actually committed or who forced Zunisha to begin to walk you know the only person that we know that existed 100% during the void century was Joy Boy and I can't connect I mean Joy Boy is not responsible for everything that occurred during the void century we can't pin him you know for everything so and his thing is obviously tied to Poseidon and the ancient weapon you know Fishman Island he's tied to that in the Noah so I don't think he's also tied to Zunisha so there's obviously going to be something else going on here during the void century we're going to find out about what happened with Zunisha who ordered Zunisha to be in walking and why Zunisha kept that you know promise kept that order for hundreds and hundreds of years but yeah um anyway uh what are your guys favorite mink obviously you all know me it's it's carrot I really hope she does join the crew to get some diversity in there and also just to get another female on the crew I mean come on the, the straw hat pirates they're a little bit of a sausage fest I mean well you, you know he, he He's a bone fest in Brooks' case. Yo ho ho ho! Get up! Like now, oh, that should be the name of his next tour. You know, you had the the Soul King Brook World Tour. Next one should be Bone Fest. You know, Bone Fest 2019. I'd I'd get tickets to that. Okay, minor side note here. There needs to be a full length album of songs sung by Brooks VA, as well as with his English VA Ian Sinclair as well. Come on, there, that needs to be a thing. We got Bink Sake. We got Bone to be Wild, and we got New World. Those are only three songs. We need, like, at least 12. We need, like, a full album of Brooks songs. Who's with me? But, um, yeah, that that's just a tangent there. Uh, another tangent, and something I, I found by researching, I knew this already, but I didn't know when I would bring it up, but it's at the end of the video, so I guess I'll just bring it up now. Uh, a mink is an actual animal. It's It's this. And uh, there's actually a mink farm. It's not in operation anymore, but it's like a mink farm that's very close to my house. Like, I drive by it, like, every day on my way to work. There was, like, an old mink farm. So, yeah, and I think they look pretty cute. Don't you think they look cute? I think they look cute. So, mink video, there's a mink. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, my favorite is Carrot. I hope she joins the crew. I know a lot of people are kind of like, maybe a little bit like, no, we don't want Carrot to join. I, I know a lot of people are maybe also skeeved out by the minks because, I mean, obviously Oda going into this probably had some inspiration from, from furries 
or other kin. Uh, you know, that's like a, probably a basis for where he was going there with this. It's kind of hard not to see it. Um, and I'm sure the furry community just love the fact that, that Oda introduced these characters now. And, you know, it makes sense, though, because One Piece, the world of One Piece, it's, it's so diverse. It's so big. I love the world building aspect of it. Uh, and every time Oda introduces a new race, it just, it makes sense, you know? It's like such a weird world that this place is. Um, you're going to have, you know, people based off of fish, people based uh, in the sky that have wings, people that are based off of animals. Of course, why wouldn't you? It makes sense. Uh, you have long legs and long arms. So just every ray, it just really builds that, that, that world building aspect together. It's like, and I just love that about One Piece. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching everybody. I don't know which, I'm going to be doing videos about fishmen and merfolk. That'll probably be like a separate video altogether about them. I'm going to do videos about the snake necks and the long arms and the long legs and all those guys and the sky races. So, uh, and the giants, obviously, I really want to do a big video about the giants and stuff. So, uh, yeah, sit tight for that. Thanks for watching, everybody. And uh, as I stated before, totally, I am not a furry. I'm, I'm not a furry. I'm serious. Not a furry. Not a furry. That's, that's the joke. That's the joke. It's the joke, okay? Do you get the joke?